Hello everyone, today we talk about 6th century Roman polyarsetic. We will make another video uh, about artillery proper. Uh, this is essentially about the siege techniques. Uh, in a way, mostly refer to structures of siege machinery, broadly meant not, not throwing engines, and also uh, talking essentially about the the theoretical side of the story. We will probably make another video in which we will make a list of all the you know siege capabilities, not just of the Romans here, but also and especially about the the enemies of the empire and how the Romans coped with. It. Right, this is an important time uh, in in European warfare because, as you know, there is a it's it's the beginning of a, an important contraction, especially towards the mid sixth century of properly of demographic and agricultural resources. So we can't say that fortresses, um, other infrastructures that can serve for, for war began to be um, either transformed because, you know, in their building maybe there were, there were less resources, but also the ones, the, the imposing thing about the, the great, the, 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 the city walls of the greatest cities of the empire start proportionally to acquire uh, an ever greater importance in siege warfare in a sense you know to it's you know uh, just to, to make you understand it in 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 poor terms we, we go towards a medieval direction right in which siege warfare had been would become let's say more important for for reasons that however are difficult to parallel between the two eras compared to the an ancient times right ancient times you know the greeks and the romans were basically fixated with major pitch battles and even in there naturally it's mostly the historiography of it that shows uh, the bigger uh, events the, the 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 most important uh, battles but naturally uh, siege warfare has been perhaps but you know overlooked even in there and we'll talk about it in another video and uh, skipping as we were saying the literary part of the story of you know the, cr the chroniclers and the, the various actual sieges that took place here we just uh, point out how the uh, siege technique of the Byzantine army at this point was rather refined right so much that the same Persians inspired themselves um, in, in on several occasions to the realizations of the Roman engineers uh, all the siege machinery uh, of the earlier times were widely, uh, still widely used. Uh, some with important, you know, mm, let's say, further caution and innovation. Even and this is an important concept that is rarely stressed. I mean, how the the crisis of the empire and the crisis of, of many systems indeed throughout all history passes not through what you would refer as to an, an involution right of or a you know rougher technique but on the contrary to uh, uh, a, an important innovation that has to cope with the, uh, the the shortages with the lack sometimes uh, of men and material and therefore to to act in, in, in war situations where you have to use really what, what is pretty damn effective in, in many ways. Um, so as we were saying we will not talk about specifically of siege, um, of throwing engines, let's put it in this way, but just to, to make an example just the relative uh, decline in, in torsion engines um, is, is not to be regarded even in here as necessarily as an involution Right, nor to think that these were actually what solved every problem back in the day, or that what existed at, at this time instead wasn't effective. But we should also introduce the thing from a broader perspective today we, 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 we want to. So, also the point we just made about the foreigners, and in this case we talked about the Persians, because naturally the eastern frontier becomes can't say necessarily the most active but definitely the one that um, had a, a more specific um, you know 
import so a greater sp specific importance of, of, of fortifications you, you may think otherwise and this is in, indeed a relative statement but I mean the idea that this was the frontier between two great empires that for as you know a, a very long time for several centuries kept fighting more or less in the same places had militarized the area right so we can see for example how important I don't know if, um, fortresses were during the Gothic War uh, where Italy still had a uh, actually a, a wide, um, uh, uh, you know, a set of fortifications and infrastructures that also uh, informed Gothic warfare um, in its uh, nature differently. For example, from Vandal Africa, where the Vandals even tore down the uh, the the city walls because they they thought it would be they wouldn't have much a chance to defend them against the Byzantines, but it would have had they would have had a greater advantage in in fact eventually attacking the Byzantines themselves once they had they had captured the city remaining without walls uh, so the importance of this could 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 be further could uh, you know uh, over time even the, the militarized frontiers of the empire think about Asia Minor eventually with the Arabs or in the same Byzantine Italy I mean along the Apennines so did these terrains were they are very tough in many ways, mostly mountainous areas um, where indeed a, f um, a fortress could, could have a, a very heavy strategical value is all a, a chapter we will analyze for, for the other centuries. Today we talk chiefly about Justinian times and we have to realize in fact how central the empire was anyway. This is something we discussed uh, at a broader level political influence still the idea that the empire was out there that this thing never ended that all the peoples that gravitated around it up to you know uh, northern Europe were fundamentally aware that that was the thing that that was the order um, and and the empire was a model of many as you know not just of political culture but in fact also of m the military one think about just the military organization the the Romans at this point had um, a great um, capacity of understanding and also of practicality at the same time. This is probably one of the, it's the highest point in many ways of the uh, hybrid between um, the Hellenic uh, intellectual superiority and the Roman uh, uh, practical superiority, right? In this capacity of understanding from the enemies, analyzing their strengths and weaknesses and uh, you know, uh, adapting to, to them and, you know, exploiting the thing. And also an important treaty uh, tradition, a literary tradition about military manuals and of great interest, in fact, towards the other populations. And no other country at this point had the polyurcetic capabilities of, uh, of Constantinople. Um, the Romans had, in this regard, were, were the heirs of this great, mostly Hellenistic legacy, in, in, in polyurcetics from which also the Romans fundamentally had derived most of their uh, siege uh, culture, or siege warfare culture let's say um, and uh, the Empire as you know relied importantly also on its specific defensive capabilities uh, think about the, the great wall that existed in Trace but the same Theodosian walls uh, and all the, the fortified centers in, in, in the other areas um, so there was no other country that could objectively also invest in a such a centralized and large-scale manner in this set. There, there are other technologies actually that arrive uh, to Constantinople either through its direct contacts with the East as far as China, right, that were still very intense at this point, uh, but also through other peoples, especially of, of mm, Middle Eastern, at least Middle Eastern influenced uh, military cultures. For example, the Avars, famously enough, brought uh, this, um, you know, the, 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 the Chinese Avar, in fact, mm, Mangonel, how, how it's, um, it's called, and were, despite being steppe peoples, they were actually pretty advanced in, into siege warfare as well, which they also, you know, got through through China, through through Persia. That's a feature that even the the Magyars will have uh, eventually. And th this area of the Western steppes is, uh, as we have already s began to, to to discuss, is definitely overlooked even in in that regard. 
so much in fact that if you read the strategic on the uh, among all the barbarians for the romans the, the avars were the, the most advanced because they combined some of the most devastating uh equestrian tactics uh, of the steps with this also with this polyarsetic capability and that w had been essentially the warrior of rome throughout its history i mean the the fact that uh you know the, the barbarians normally didn't have this this great uh aptness in siege warfare right this this is almost a it becomes almost a cliche if you read procopius famously enough about especially the gothic war um you see that the, the ostrogoths that had m among all the germans had the ones that had become more better acquainted actually with with siege engines because of also having in largely inherited the, the Italic military administration um, were however still you know in relative difficulty to, to employ them um, also as far as the the Navy was concerned and so on uh, that's an interesting topic that maybe we'll discuss another time because I have my own opinions uh, about the, the cliche proper but yes, tendentially it is true, right? That was this. The Persians had become the what essentially the greatest enemy of the most dangerous enemy of Rome for many reasons. Here, the West, the the West has, had been lost. Justinian reconquers it, but as you know, also that's somewhat shortly. So, uh, you you start from I don't know the the early empire where the Roman Empire was objectively the strongest thing uh, ever seen, and the their assassins. In in the on the Iranian plateau had you know were a smaller power, and notoriously also they were mocked by for this reason by the ancient historiographers because they didn't have much uh, siege capabilities as this people arrived essentially from the steppes but not having uh, because also the steppes evolve over time right the steppes of the Parthians back in the day were not the, the steppes of the of the Avars. Right, there, there is a, a, a transition also because of Romanization, actually. And that, that's exactly what happened is that the, the Sassanids, and said by the third century, have the sources telling us that they had become uh, more, more effective, not just because they had redrawn in, in many ways the, the Persian political and military culture by inspiring directly to the Achaemenids and this universalistic ambition, but also because some Roman turncoats had taught them. Uh, the the secrets right of polyarsetics, but at least they hadn't developed yet on their own, uh, and provided themselves with this extraordinary siege warfare capabilities that would put the Romans alert. Because you know the Parthians were a, a pain in in, um, in, in the side, let's say, uh, in, um, in, uh, in 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 the sense, in as much as they could launch these raids, and you know, and being difficult to also strategically center in a way, just as tactically speaking, because they would just retreat and retreat and not give in battle till the end. So, but as far as, you know, a fortified area was concerned, they, there were no great problem. Like, I don't know, the Germans hadn't been, you know, but the, the, there is this broader capacity, indeed, of, of, of cultures that are not properly mm, set, fully sedentarized, statal, um, uh, re, um, you know, polities that do not have this literally the, the resources, right, uh, broadly meant of many material of skills right, to commit themselves into warfare it was a somewhat even a sense of um, of cowardice from their side to protect themselves by walls, right, it, which is was naturally an hypocrisy, but in, in, in the military culture of these peoples, right, the idea, I don't know, I think about the Germans arriving at a point under Constantinople and saying something like, you know, we are used to fight against men, not against walls, right, and that was a better way to say, you know, um, to accept their own limits, uh, even in that regard, without making a poor figure. Um, so it's uh, naturally the empire displays this highly advanced, also technological capacity that other peoples do not have. And re regarding to that, as you know, I have a bit of a anti-technologistic prejudices, for which, of course, the strength of the empire was not because they had walls or catapults or whatever but fundamentally because they were a, a real state they had a professional army a centralized uh, government a, a bureaucracy right a, a, a tax system and so on the sixth century is in a way uh, as we were saying at the very beginning a moment 
of, of contraction, not just for the empire, but also for other peoples that however levels a bit also the differences, right? The comparison was making before the early empire. Now, the empire is essentially just the eastern chunk. Well, for example, the Sasanians have extended on as far as uh, Arabia, even up to, to Ethiopia in, in a way, uh, the, the, the boundaries of India from the other side. So they are somewhat fighting on equal ground. And they, they're highly uh, hybrid in this sense. I mean, the, the, the Romans get Persianized, the, the Persians got Romanized. Rome is probably actually the one that is more impacting from a cultural point of view, because naturally it's it's a state, but uh, the Sassanids were not fully, like they were half and half, like as far as Mesopotamia was concerned, they had also their own, as you know, as Ctesiphon, Ktes this, you know, Mesopotamia, uh, dramatically advanced area since millennia, heavily urbanized, large agricultural resources, that's where the Sassanids st from this Semitic uh, base start to, to centralize, to create a state, but as far as the Iranian plateau is concerned, that's still like a feudal reality, very fluid, and that is actually the, the, the true core land of, 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 the, uh, of the empire in a way, so that's another thing, that's not a state, that's feudalism, which is a different thing. Um, so this is the general background we, we can start talking about this stuff. So as we were saying, we will talk essentially about siege techniques and relative to this, um, we talk about the peri strategicus, right, uh, or strategicus if you prefer, that is this important treaty that refers uh, precisely and in detail on the characteristics of construction, so we're destined to resist to, to a siege, right? It contains actually a wide variety uh, of information relative also to civilian buildings and so on, but it's important also for the military one. Also consider uh, that in these times everything in terms of infrastructure would do, right? There, as we were saying, there, there was a sort of militarization of society at some levels, especially on the frontier, so uh, I don't know, just think about during the, the, the siege of Rome by the, the Ostrogoths that, you know, the Byzantines entrenched into the mausoleum of Hadrian that was not meant to be but a fortress, but like just, I don't know, the Colosseum for the, throughout all the Middle Ages would be a, a very important fortress for the, the, the Roman nobility, that, you know, major battles would be fought around. So it's, it's the world that... Uh, uh, in, uh, think about, we were talking about the Visigoths the other day that they fought um, also uh, entrenched into the, uh, the arena of Nîmes in southern France. So all these heavily Romanized regions have still these major infrastructures that definitely con do contribute to the, also to the defense proper. And mainly also to the city gates, right? Those are things, uh, all the, the Romans, the major Roman cities at least had important city gates and became very, very important, right? Some of the largest uh, could even list uh, the, the Constantinople naturally was was the largest city uh, in the empire. Then, then by a few actors uh, actually came Rome, right? Constantinople actually had, had the, the double walls because it was probably the Const Constantinian, uh, well, originally it was the probably the Byzantine, one of Byzantium on the Acropolis, but whatever. Uh, then Constantine had made its own, but the, the major ones, as you know, were the Theodosians towards the, the western side of the city, because all cities at this time had, you know, like the center, inhabited one, in actually wide areas, uh, not just because of the population, but properly were left by, by the foe uh, free, because either that was the market uh, with, I don't know, the herds were uh, taken in, or it became properly an encamping area for the armies in case of siege, and naturally from the most defensible area of the city. So was Rome. Rome had gone intensely depopulated, were forests and wild animals in some areas, but also had this massive Aurelian walls that would would work pretty well during the the various sieges. Think about the one of Belisarius that you know held out against the gods. Then Antioch was the third, I think, uh, then Carthage, so respectively in Syria and Africa that would, would, would do. Uh, 
in fact, the Vandals didn't raise actually the Carthaginian uh, walls, also Belisarius uh, mm, exploited that. Then followed uh, Ravenna, Milan, um, Verona, and it, so these important I Italian cities, and then in the east, Gerasa and Aphrodisias, that also historically had been uh, important centers. And these are important, really key to to control the, the relative territories they they are really also when they will in part will be lost will become uh, the same uh, some of the greatest centers of for for the various for other peoples like think about how important Milan or or Verona or uh, would become for the Longobards or Ravenna for the same exarchate uh, of the Romans in in uh, as the administrative center of the uh, of the the peninsula. Antioch would have this dramatic importance throughout all the Middle Ages. Famously enough, the Byzantines would, in fact, at some point reconquer it and hold out against the, the Arab threats and so on. So, according to the Paris Strategiques, the walls up to the height of at least seven cubits, that is roughly 3.3 meters, had to be constituted by stones of the largest dimension possible, uh, accurately, uh, you know, put together in the construction, uh, and uh, of the same thickness uh, altogether of the walls, so that they couldn't be easily disgregated by the ramps or demolishers' squads. Um, this is important, naturally, because you have to imagine really the, you know, up to the 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 development of firearms how physically demanding i mean firearms bring in a uh, a dramatic amount of energy that had never been seen right just if you look at the physical quantities uh, by the 14th the, the, the by the, the 15th to the 16th century of just an arquebus let alone a, a real artillery gunner like a cannon, but even just a, a musket of the early kinds that actually were muskets originally were artillery, not not, not properly handguns. Um, it, it's something that by far surpasses by scale by by scale every everything that existed before. Um, naturally, th there were ways and ways of using uh, the various systems. Uh, it's never about even here about the single technological thing, but here we're talking about really big physical dimensions. How could this this will remain? We'll have to make a video about this at some point, uh, especially in medieval siege warfare. But for ancient times it was basically the same. Um, you know, the simply most armies didn't have any mean of breaking walls in a in a short time or thinking that those the defenders wouldn't repair them, right? And it was dramatically easy to block an entire campaign around a city, in fact, uh, or uh, even a, a smaller fortresses, because that was the thing. I mean, all, all history, even just up to the 17th century, where firearms were already an important thing, all strategy fundamentally revolves around this. All battles are triggered by uh, an army besieging a city and another army coming to relieve the siege. This is it. This is standard. It's the largest battles ever fought are fundamentally about this. There is no other, no other thing. Um, and just think about what it means to have a, a wall that is as thick as, as as tall. Fundamentally, just for, from a physical point of view, it's it, you know you, you don't even try at some point, right? Naturally, not all fortresses were like this. Most of them would be already uh, something you know just palisades and mud and so on. So, but the largest ones, and especially in this, especially Mediterranean centers, as we've seen before, were ever more imposant realities, given that even uh, certain siege technologies were, were disappearing or were not even just worth, worth that. Not even in the ancient world, you have to think that, I don't know, the Romans resolved every single siege just by using catapults or, or anything, right? It, it was even in there a broader... Uh, it took a lot of time, right? It was really entrenching the wall city so that uh, you could block the the supplies. That was fundamental. If that didn't happen, there wasn't much you could do. Uh, then trying either with by mining the walls, uh, which was uh, 
you know, pretty standard in a sense, but not so frequent, right? Uh, and it took a lot of work even in there, and depended on the ground and the terrain, um, on the also the, the the forces involved, the time involved, uh, but mostly was starving these places to surrender. Uh, and assaults would be launched depending on usually you know the the, the the garrisons of the centers were usually small right with with very small amount of troops who could maintain very big uh, f fortresses so this is also what made this but you know if there was a, a, an entire army within the city it was pretty unlikely you could you could storm it right um, so it was also about the, all this um, mostly dead time, so waiting, co constant, you know, yeah, throwing uh, a stone here and there, but not necessarily making because of it. According to the Peri Strategicus, to the top of the walls there had to be battlements or parapets, and they were called in Greek epalxes, and you know that Greek is coming back, you know, naturally in the former eastern half of the empire as the, the, the aside from the administration was still in Latin under and naturally the official language of the empire under Justinian, but you know in literature was overwhelmingly um, the prevalent language. And the plus imagine any other structure in, in vote, right, that was attached to it and that would in a way extend and create different angles. The angles here were important. The the angles of this uh, battlements had to be uh, squared, not 90 degrees in fact, and at least three spans deep, that is roughly 70 centimeters, to resist the impact of the stone projectiles. And the towers built on, on the walls with more or less regular intervals had to present an hexagonal form with equal sides. This hexagonal form would become kind of characteristic of, of, of the time. With the, uh, and the, the object was to uh, offer a form that would fleet more from the trajectories of the heavier projectiles while the internal side had to present a cylindrical form, also to give more mass to, to the structure altogether. The um, the ditch, known as tafron in Greek, had to be realized with um, a, a wide, not inferior to 40 cubits, that is 18 meters, and deep at least as much as the foundations. And between the ditches and the true and proper walls, known as tachon, had uh, there to be, uh, if possible, naturally, uh, a, a, a second line of walls, the so-called proteikisma, that functioned as the first line of defense and as measure to contrast the digging of, of, of uh, tunnels from the side of the enemy. So this structure is pretty, you know, pretty simple. I even made a, a little drawing uh, about it. And uh, the the objective is, is obvious. The, the Saint Theodosian walls actually were built like that. They had even you know ditches with water. So as you know, the Theodosian walls resisted to to every assault, um, except the, the one of the Fourth Crusade, uh, up to 1453. And uh, it, it's a really a geometrical principle. And it's very easy to understand. These are were this was knowledge that was known since I don't know Sumerian times. The Tafros, so this this ditch was was not just um, you know a simple ditch it was just a, a, also a large area, right? Very deep, as deep in fact as the f of these first walls that were normally on the top uh, of it, uh, the Proteikisma, um, that therefore could have this dramatic eye because you had to to go down or at least to try to fill this, this ditch with material that naturally the larger the ditch was and the more unstable it would become you couldn't even pro properly you know bring in the um, the heavier I don't know ramps or siege towers then you had this smaller wall but nevertheless effective one at least ideally not all uh, fortifications could 
be built like that. I mean, th this thing costs it naturally, and resources, are, uh, resources as we we're saying, were running dramatically short uh, at this point. Um, in fact, you know, banally, even just how temples were torn down and the, the you know the various building material uh, reused in many ways. I mean, th there was this way of recycling the thing. Uh, the aqueducts that didn't work anymore, not also not just because they were not up kept, because but literally because th there were no people to that they they could serve to right population. The cities had shrunk, and what would you know a river would be enough uh, while upkeeping the aqueducts so, and so on. But it was still rare to have such a well built um, system. Naturally, we have to imagine of every, uh, on a smaller scale, every other type of um, uh, organic material. I mean, palisades were present probably all over. Um, there were cities, naturally, were part of the walls were, had fallen down, um, they are being destroyed, that temporarily just went on with, with, uh, with palisades and ditches. And this is you know, pretty normal in every medieval context if you know it. And that would be effective. You have to reason in terms, you know, how, you know, in cost benefit ratio, right? If something serves, you don't need to spend too much for it. This was the ideal thing, right? The Byzantine treatises are often uh, ideal, positivistic in nature, right? That was a typical Hellenic way of thinking, but it was based objectively on a on prescriptions that did work on, on a scientific base. Uh, so you had this proteichisma, that wall that you had to either break or get through, passing the ditch, I don't know how. That usually was also another ditch between that and the walls. And consider that th this, the, this from the second walls that were taller than the proteichisma, uh, the major walls known as the taikon, uh, throughout all this, further projectiles would be shot, so everything was calculated geometrically also on the base of the range of, of, of missile fire. So, uh, really, certain peoples didn't even have the capabilities, they, certain arms didn't have the capabilities of, um, of, of, of surpassing this thing. And that's how Constantinople also was, was held for such a long time. Naturally, others had more destructive, uh, greater destructive capabilities, but uh, in a sense, they uh, they had to sweat for it, and maybe they lost in in something else. So all these strategical considerations here are apart because we're reading a treatise. So it's something theoretical. Then how the the, the practice of it uh, worked, we we shall we shall read just through the literary accounts of the, the single sieges, right? Uh, so the first attempt, however, usually carried out by the attackers was the one, so because this also functioned for 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 the Byzantines as well. Um, after the Justinian reconquest, the empire was largely on the defensive, or at least, you know, it just carried out uh, certain campaigns of, of uh, relatively limited scale. The, the Justinian expansion was something overwhelming. Most of the uh, consider that strategically speaking, most of the cities fell simply because you know once you annihilate uh, an army in open field, that uh, these uh, fortresses collapse, right? It's virtually it's as if the old resistance ceased, right? That that is pretty clear in, in many circumstances, uh, and that's how in fact most fortresses were were actually caught, right? It's not that they were stormed. Uh, there were naturally a lot of pl plots. Uh, this is typical, right? At some point, when when I hope I finish the PhD, I will bombard you insanely with like hundreds of you know of of these cases that are documented here and there, uh, and about the 14th century, just to make you understand how um, everything is in close of its in terms really connected to politics and society, right? There is not a a, a technical thing uh, suspensed in the air for saying, okay, in order to storm a city, that that's how it happens. And, uh, everybody concerned about the mecha the mechanics of it, like how they did it. Simply, cities most of the times opened their gates, right, or uh, literally, you know, and made and these various uh, commanders entering and uh, you know opening eventually just the the gates outside or you know with assaults and so on. So 
it's uh, it, it's all a mix of all these factors. In fact, siege warfare is very um, like, especially if you look at disclosuring books about medieval warfare, there are plenty of them. Um, they they concentrate mostly like on the shape of fortifications and on the uh, pol uh, on this siege techniques fundamentally. But when it comes to to explaining serially how in reality this thing was solved, the, uh, the, there is no, they hardly give the dimension of, of what the, this this whole thing was usually uh, about, right? In a way, it was even more effective at some point to to uh, to make a coup without an army, but just uh, you know a very uh, you know a sort of commander, right? Because w once you entered in. Usually, as we've seen, the garrisons were small. So, yeah, the moment we, which you took the walls, most of these garrisons either retreated in the citadel or fled the city, right? Because they didn't have, you know, once the walls were virtually down in that sense, they, they and, and this reveals how effective it, they actually were when they were properly uh, garrisoned, uh, it was over, right? And this is, in a nutshell, the history of all the of of siege warfare up to the 17th century historically speaking or maybe a bit earlier but you know still largely revolving around uh, the same logic right so the first attempt to however storm the walls uh or better is was to to make them crumble simply because a breach could simply make uh guys pouring in even cavalry entering, uh, which naturally can't be done, in, in, you know, with, with towers or or, or 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 ladders. I wouldn't like to say. I mean, I think I can think. I have never I never heard of, of horses actually, you know, um, unless they, there, were, there were things like ramps specifically. There were cer certain testudos. The you know, think of the Kelon um, that we'll see in a while that were a bit like ramps. So uh, you have to imagine that not all you know the average siege warfare would be fought in not around cities but um, around uh, smaller fortresses in, in the frontier right so uh, you know they weren't dramatically uh, they didn't have dramatically tall walls there are a few meters right and they were already enough in, in a way uh, but the first attempt ideally was the one to carry out a a breach specifically in the walls so that the troops could pour in and this was a complex enterprise because it it worked also in here historically by you know with, with certain specific machinery to to cover yourself from the enemy uh, projectiles right the world of, of any kind mostly would be arrows and slings but you know there were catapults also on the walls and that's something that just etymologically speaking you know it's a, that something that smashes and pierces through shields uh even the larger ones of of planks of wood and so on uh but there was this this way of approaching arriving to the the down the the the, the in fact the the, one, the 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 base of the walls not underground but overground uh, and being covered by these larger roofs, right? And and this was the testudo proper, right? Uh, the kelon, not the the testudo in the sense of the of, of you know a, a military unit covered with its own shields, which is something that has assumed such a an important iconographical and pop, you know popular no notoriety that sometimes I stop to 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 remember just the fact that. The testudo in itself, in a formation, is is nothing special, but especially not even a, a good sign of a of, of tactical situation, because that's mostly used, indeed, in in siege warfare mostly, or at least in those conditions where you cannot defend yourself better. So yes, that th there was this tactic that actually was carried out not just by the Romans, right? Many people think out oh, the testudo was a Roman thing. Absolutely not. It was used by any army. Um, uh, and not even the fact that the Romans had those shields that allegedly worked better for four minutes, which is actually not even true, uh, or at least the you know other shields, uh, the flat ones worked even better for that matter, um, is uh, is just that 
it's like the shield wall. Like people believe that shield walls were were a special tactic, you know, this refund. No, it was used exclusively because of pairing, uh, you know, from missiles in the front, and and the shield wall itself is just the, the reflection of a also a thicker uh, order that the troops maintain. But it's the shield in itself, you you don't fight with a you, you you don't have an offensive capability with a shield. It's just minimal just if you want to punch somebody with the envoy in the teeth but you know it, there is nothing special or functional in saying oh, I put the shield in a way or another that, that serves most of our sheltering from projectiles that's literally it right um, and every single people we know with the goals use it they at any people we know used it because when you're out there in, in the open and someone targets you what, what what's the, the person that you know uh, has a minimal intelligence to put the shield over himself and that's what every single infantry has ever done historically in, in all the history of warfare right the romans were no specialty in this at all so even if we don't have this also dramatic iconographic evidence like i don't know in tragic times of this uh the studiness that were showed also because they were cool to watch you know uh the, consider that the soldiers made sometimes circus games um, to to amuse the local populations and there was this thing of you know even uh, guys creating uh, like literally a ramp uh, there, there is an evidence actually of Romans during I think it was the second Macedonian war um, to to storm Ambracia that they you know they basically made the, the troops uh, you know climbing the walls over a ramparts of literally of men creating this the studio, this kilone um, as a ramp that, that would be able for, for the, uh, the companions running over it to get over the walls, right? But mostly was like a like an exercise, right? It's not that you solved tactical problems with that or that it ever had a dramatic uh, or, or specific value either than its most elementary anti-missile function. The Kelone is mentioned for example by Agatius in this time, Agatius 3.5 um, and the objective was um, reaching the walls um, t in order to remove a certain amount of stones and, and, and substituting them with a structure of wood beams that could at a certain point collapse at the, with the objective to provoke uh, you know, the, 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 the fall of great portions of the walls and this naturally also happened underground and there is a good evidence of very sophisticated um, tunnel systems used uh, especially in the eastern frontier against the Sassanids including even bacteriological warfare uh, to to get to gas fundamentally the, the guys that were in these tunnels like rats so much we have evidence. We, we have found the actual tunnels with th there are uh, Roman and Persian corpses there. So uh, that that's fantastic, absolutely. And but that tells you something that w also in there was widespread in, in ancient warfare was the norm was you know at least one of the options normally on the table in every single kind of of warfare at the time. Now uh, these treatises, as we were saying contemplate both the attackers and the defender perspectives obviously so in the case a breach had been uh, carried out in the wall the most uh, common practice for the defenders was the construction of a second wall behind it right and also with a with a specific triangular form that not only rendered much more uh, difficult the further use of the ramp from the side of the attackers, but also it allowed to obstacle the um, eruption, the, the assault of the assailants, in fact, um, and to keep under fire from, from this wall, it, you know, it was possible anyway, uh, from, from a double direction, from different angles, more distant angles, at the same point of the breach. So this is also something that you can do if you have the materials, like if this is a fort, scattered out there in the Balkanic frontier, you don't have anything inside, what, what do you do? Yeah, you start digging the, 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 the earth uh, inside the camp to, to create maybe a rampart around 
the the you know behind the the place where the guys are breaching but sometimes you don't even have that material so this this is all in you know in the best as a prescription in in the in the uh, in the in the pink of, of the situation uh, but um, th this is effective indeed because when the ram arrives if you at least the axis of the ram is you know punching straight in the in the corner of the uh, in the upper corner of the triangle on the opposite side of the the, the side of in which the the walls are uh, theoretically the ram is um, especially if the the wall the, the the second wall behind it is not even so uh, distant right it, it's difficult for the ram to to enter and to maneuver and to you know uh, to to load the, the vectors with force to, to break uh, further naturally often the second wall was weaker than the first one at least unless it was I don't know as we were saying before a take on and the breach had carried out in the Proteikisma but theoretically at that point it was the, the broader stone structure that also didn't need to be built also uh, here I don't know we, whether we have actually evidence but I think so I mean once uh, um, a part of the wall was was br was broken it was easy to rebuild it with the same the mm, debris of, of of the of from the breach um, so this was this could be easily done and it was done we've seen it even at the siege of Vienna in 1683 I mean even in much modern times uh, so it was very easy actually to repair this stuff much easier than we think uh, the assailants really had it had a bad time right and uh, th all these things could be done mostly with a superiority of men and material that the that usually a big army could have against the the average for fortress but that was the average fortress in fact so you could gain maybe a, I don't know in a province a certain edge by seizing it but it was not like storming Constantinople which nobody carried out Besides uh, the uh, you know defense that a testudo could manually uh, provide, the wall could be demolished also with the uh, help, as we've seen, of a ram called the krios, properly the the uh, like the arius in Latin, and, and the same animal in zodiac sign, and uh, as the one detailed described uh, in detail described by Procopius during uh, the, the the siege of Rome from the side of Bitiges gods which is f um, the book uh, 521 6 and 8 11 23 to um, seat and uh, a structure of wooden beams was protected by um, a cover of uh, skins of uh, hides, right? That had that you know were more difficult to set on fire. Usually they were wet uh, for for this reason, and that had the same f uh, function as a structure to sustain uh, this long pole that, that presented at uh, the extremity an iron head. The ram were was then maneuvered, making it swing naturally with with this push along the axis of you know uh, in this account at least 50 men right the problem was naturally concentrating the greater force on a smaller surface so naturally also and famously enough the uh, you know the the, the, the impacting uh, part of the head had to be usually round and that's also why it had to be in harder material because it naturally had to absorb the the, the shock itself so we're talking about actually a pretty impressive force for the times standards uh, and it could con cause considerable damage also the measures that could be adopted to contrast the combination of Kelone and Krios the Testudo and Arias uh, were for example uh, knocking out the machine's protection by setting it on fire or hooking it with a with a with a grappling hood uh, known in Greek as arpage 
or to destroy basically the uh, the ram's beam by making it you know like literally crashing it with a with a stone thrown from uh, from the walls or even lifted by a specific crane with a counterweight so something fairly sophisticated known as antibarema in Greek or with a mm, special machine described in the Peri Strategicus 13 123 through a passive defense that could be opposed by laying some literally some mattresses known as tuli or uh, sacks filled with straw and sand some perches with iron hooks could be also employed we know it from Procopius 8 11 tw from 27 to 33 to hook and demolish the the the, the buttresses or the um, other you know defensive machines right in especially the ones in, in wood as you know as you understand would be more vulnerable while the defenders could employ so-called wolves the lucoi that were already mentioned by Vegetius 225 that consisted in heavy um, structures provided with uh, you know pointy you know very sharp points to throw against the assailants this is also what Procopius says in 521.90. And in all the sieges, an, a big importance, as we've seen, were also the mining, the tunneling and mining activities from the side of the besiegers, and also a counter tunneling from the side of the besieged. And the, the diggings of the assailants were often masked by some screens or uh, heaps of, of earth to prevent the defenders to see in which point the uh, the sapping had began and what was the direction of, of the tunnels. And to contrast the sapping, um, the, that often didn't follow linear tracks, right? So, uh, and exactly to, to trick the defenders, it was advised to dig a, a trench or at least 10 cubits that is 5 meters distant from uh, from the wall right and deep as much as the foundation so to intercept the uh, the tunnel and to repel the assailants by either uh, flooding the, uh, the the tunnel or to fill it with smoke as we were saying before um, and at the siege of Urbino is mentioned by Procopius 6, 1915, the employment of vine, uh, known as stoa, that is gates in the, at least in, in, in Greek, etymologically, that is structures of, cover structures that allowed the attackers to approach safely the walls. They were probably um, some, of the, some of the most widespread let's call it machinery, but the, they were fundamentally literally uh, like big shields, right, big covers. And siege towers were also employed in the most demanding sieges. Naturally the objective is to load them with troops that you can all, you know, unload at, uh, at once on the on the enemy on the enemy walls, on the enemy ramparts, and um, and even the barbarians had learned how to use them this time, uh, albeit almost always, as we were saying before, with scarce results. For example, at the um, siege of Rome, Be Belisarius uh, vanified the, uh, at least what is presented, literally speaking, as the naive approaching of towers and other siege machineries uh, of machinery of the gods, simply by uh, killing the oxen that were carrying it. This is in Procopius 5.21.5 and in 5.22.8. In a case of which siege towers had managed to reach the walls, the defenders could build certain counter towers, known in fact as antifrigia in Greek, to simply to counter them. And um, those were also devoid of, uh, of a roof to allow the use of uh, stone 
uh, throwing machines and however at the base of the towers um, uh, in uh, in uh, in stone uh, the the wall had to be realized certain small uh, iron doors to allow the besieged to launch certain sorties also to set on fire the siege machinery uh, which happened you know there were also uh, holes dug into into the walls proper I found cases not in here but of things like even you know uh, they had taken away the, the, the stones of the, of the wall and set on fire the internal structure of, of the you know for the ladders all the stuff that was all in wood so it set on fire easily and burn burn everybody inside or uh, stuff like that you know the actually if you study siege warfare in detail you find a lot of um, pretty unorthodox and in, inventive very ingenious solutions that naturally depended also on the great um, complexity of this set of defenses like the first thing we, we could say about them actually is that uh, it was a complex mix of both stone and wood um, following the, the ground, the terrain, uh, fortresses were built outside the city walls and sometimes even in proximity so that they could support each other it went with you know, bol um, you know flying bridges um, and uh, that could for example shoot the enemies while they were approaching the gates I mean from the rear because they were outside were you know more advanced in their position so it's um, it was all that and often sources at this time do not talk much about it right because especially I would say in this one as we were saying before there is a specifically you know uh, theoretical side to the story it wants to show the, the clean neat picture of how to, to show that there is a logic in various you know angles and geometric dispositions and so on um, and even the same uh, polyrosetic practice here is not necessarily as we've seen explained fully in its entirety there you have to value the the proper you know concrete you know the, the separation between the historiography treatises literature in general what the, the military practice was it's not if you read this stuff it, it's actually what happened right it's maybe sometimes the only source that will talk about it from this time but as we we're seeing yesterday just talking about military logic by analogy we actually know that it was plenty of other solutions that cannot even logically be, uh, you know, encompassed uh, by, and if they wouldn't be for centuries and centuries by military treatises. So um, everything was way more flexible, and siege warfare also increasing in importance and and having its own uh, development, even sophistication in here. So the question here is to to realize the the broader Mm, let's say complexity of, of of the problems. The fact that warfare was solved in ways that were really depending on on the situation, as always, and that did not have a standard practice. Uh, the more naturally, the the bigger the involvement was, and naturally, the the more standardized the thing becomes, right? Because for besieging a city, there are usually a few ways and, and the ways to break through also are a few but how this would practically happen um, it, it really depends and that's why we have to expand massively on this topic and why there is a uh, such an important uh, space left out and often misunderstood just even historically uh, especially in this phase in the, the beginning say in the early middle ages and what siege warfare was at the time and why especially was like that at the time right um, and we can't see a, a true regression a true involution we see simply new situations new contexts new possibilities and therefore new parameters to, to resettle the, 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 the matter but we, we noticed that as, as soon as things began to you know be more dynamic more cinetic in a way the same systems reappeared and even just the, the sources do not tell us everything uh, so we, we we're not even ex we shouldn't even expect them to to tell us at, at a certain level but we know that there was much more to it and in fact these times were way more dynamic than we think right early medieval times unfortunately appear prospectively as less dynamic 
uh, and they were in absolute terms. It was really less energy involved, but this doesn't mean that locally actually there was a proportion let less commitment right than it was before on the contrary and that's why also polyorsetics would evolve historically uh, during the middle ages in actually more effective way both in attack and in defense than the ancient world had been which is something that you rarely hear right it's obvious that you know something like the trebuchet was way more devastating than by the 13th century than anything we had ever seen in the ancient world uh, but and more precise more reliable and so on but in order even here to explain why it was the case you have to understand what what the ancient world really was what were the needs posed by that and the ones posed by medieval warfare and even in there you will find uh, aside from this tops let's say uh, uh, also widely homogeneous reality that was the one of pre-industrial times probably man uh, so this is basically it, and we will expand on um, throwing engines uh, another time. For now, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise do a like, or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content. I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.